Oh, good evening, and welcome to our commemorative Air Force Warbird Tube webinar for this evening. I'm your host, Steve Bus, and certainly glad that you could join us tonight. This webinar series is made possible by the commemorative Air Force, and you can support the CAF through membership or donations. For details on how you can further CAF's mission to educate, inspire, and honor, please visit our website, commemorativeairforce.org. Now, as you enjoy tonight's presentation, some questions may come to mind. If you have a question, just type it in the chat box. We'll save time at the end to answer those questions, or we'll try to get them in uh, during the presentation if we can. So joining me from uh, a little cool in Georgetown, Texas today are several members of the uh, Devil Dog Squadron, Ernie Henderson, Robert Chalmers, Greg Peterson, and Beth Jenkins. Welcome to you all, and uh, let's talk the Devil Dog tonight. Well, thanks very much. Um, thank you for everybody that's joining in. Uh, we were going to have a, a, a brief presentation of kind of the history of the Devil Dog and describe where it came from. So a lot of people don't know that the Marine Corps in the Pacific used B-25s in World War II for going after shipping and shore positions and things like that. So we thought we'd do a quick little history of how that came about and then describe the specific squadron, BMV 612, that we represent with the Devil Dog Squadron. So it's painted and configured to look like one of the airplanes in the Marine Corps squadron, BMV 612, that was lost in the Pacific during World War II. All right, well, uh, of course, any historical uh, perspective on the, the B-25 kind of has to start in 1942, of course, it just had the uh, anniversary of the uh, Doolittle Raid. Uh, which was uh, in uh, April of 1942, and uh, of course that uh, sort of started turning the tide of the uh, of the war uh, in the Pacific. And uh, of course, uh, one of the well, the last uh, surviving uh, Doolittle Raider, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dick Cole, a CAF member, uh, passed away uh, just a couple of years ago. But he was a great supporter of uh, the CAF, so I just wanted to make mention of that anniversary and and uh, him as well because we always. Uh, like to remember uh, those, those veterans that have been special to uh, CAF throughout the years. But let's move forward a little bit in the history of the war as the Marine Corps uh, picked up the uh, the B-25 and, and renamed it. So let's start with that, the PBJ. What does that mean? Well, peanut butter and jelly, no. <laughs> um, is what it represents. And the North American built the one we have in Kansas City in 1944. It was found by the CAF on a grass strip in Rockdale, Texas. And they bought it, I believe in 80, sold it to somebody, and in 82, these gentlemen donated it back. Rodney Parrish restored this particular airplane for the BNB 612, because he was a Survivor of the DB612 group wanted on the next under. He wanted to represent what they did, and he wanted to honor his friends from the number three ship. They had 20 on their 23rd missions. They never came back, so they don't know what happened to them. So it's, it's an honor for them to for us to keep this history alive. So back in World War II, when the war in Europe was declining and the war in the Pacific was still going strong, the Marine Corps needed a different, they needed the B-25 for going after shipping and the short positions and whatnot, but as opposed to the classic B-25, which had the glass nose on it and the bombardier section up in the front, uh, they didn't need that. They did a lot of low altitude scraping against ships and did a lot of nighttime missions. Why the, and that's why they were painted dark. So the Marine Corps acquired just over 700 of these B-25s. They were manufactured in Kansas City. Uh, and you see this picture here with all the machine guns on the nose. So uh, and some models, which ours has, uh, had 50 caliber machine guns, eight of them in the nose, and then there were two on each side. So 12, 50, 24 to go after a ship. Um, at a very low altitude, sometimes 100 to 200 feet above the water. And they also use them for what's called skip bombing. And in that case, what that means is they're flying so low over the water that when they drop bombs close to a ship, the bombs are still flying flat. They would literally 
skip across the water and hit the ships because it was it was almost impossible to hit them from a high altitude. So, uh, There's a picture of the original number three ship that Veldog was based after. Uh, we met a gentleman in Oshkosh named George Sabini, who was a survivor of the BNB 612 group. And he wanted to sign the bomb bag because he didn't get to sign it when the double dog had made one of the reunions. And so he, that was the only thing he had left because they had lost his locker. And that was the picture he sent us was the number three ship. But what's unique about that is that sort of a Snoopy nose that it has on the front of it. Later in the war, and BMB 612 was the pioneer of this, uh, they practiced in North Carolina at Cherry Point uh, with this top secret technology of a radar in, the, in that dome um, in the front of the airplane. So they could fly night missions and use the radar to locate the ships and then target the ships with rockets that were mounted underneath the ring, wings. Uh, that was one of the unique things of BMB 612 is the ability to go in and do these night missions with radar. Uh, it was one of the first instances of using radar not to uh, guide the rockets. They would just point the airplane at them and fire the rockets uh, once they got close enough. So it was sort of hit and miss, uh, but that's the first real use of the radar in World War II to help the ships locate or help the airplanes locate the ships in the water. Let's talk. Go ahead. Well, because they only their missions were only at night, so they didn't need all the gunner positions in the back because they weren't being shot at at night. But the problem was they were coming back to islands smaller than this airport property, and so those that they lost were they could have gotten shot down. They could have just gotten lost because they had to. Um, <laughs> they had to. Um, this is a devil cap. This is our sponsor. Um, but they had to, at night, they would come back to these islands by the navigation at night. So you'll see that these PBJs did not have the turret on top, they had a stargazer. And that's how they navigated. And there's a complete history of the BMB 612 squadron for those that are interested. We have it posted on our website, but. Um, if anybody's interested, this book, uh, which is several hundred pages long, was actually a, a, an autobiographical rec record of the crew members of VNB 612 and what they went through from the training initially and, and then the, the deployment in the Pacific. And it's told from their perspective and what they were doing. It's a pretty interesting read. And if you would like to have a copy of it, we have a PDF version of it. and. If you send us an email to info at devildogsquadron.com, we'll be happy to send you a link to that book that you can download. So where did the, uh, the actual the genesis of, of painting the, this particular B-25 to represent the VMB 612? Ozzy Parrish was the one that wanted to restore the airplane, and he was the survivor of the VMB 612. So they were down in Brownsville restoring this airplane. Um, the nose arc, if you looked at the original airplane, they didn't get to have nose arc because the moon could reflect their location at night. But Ozzy wanted to let people know that the Marines did have B-25s. And of course, they designated the PBJ-1 base. So that's why we have the devil dog as our nose arc. Um, we're here to keep this Marine history alive. And, um, Ozzy was very instrumental in putting this or getting this airplane restored originally. And as I understand it, he was uh, a part of the number three ship crew, uh, but was not obviously not on the airplane the night it was lost. He was not a part of the number three ship crew. He was part of the BNB 12 group, and he wanted to honor his friends from the number three ship. And that's why the number three was designated on the, the airplane and here to honor his friends that they lost. 
So since the uh, the airplane came online with the uh, CAF, it's always flown in the Devil Dog livery. Is that correct? Yes, yes, that's correct. Uh, so when 1982 was when it was first donated to the CAF, uh, it did see some history of moving about in different places from. Uh, from well, once the CAF acquired it, it it's been. In the Dallas area, it's been uh, here in Georgetown. It was, in the past, it was down in Houston. It's what's moved around a bit from its original location in Harlington, Texas. It's been at home here at uh, Georgetown at Thomas Joyce since about the year 2000. And for those not familiar with where Georgetown is located, you're uh, relatively close to Waco. Oh, well, we're we're north of Austin, Texas, about 30 miles. As I say, Austin's a suburb of Georgetown. There you go. <laughs> so with the uh, with the airplane, it's uh, been with the squadron since about 2000. Uh, how many hours do you estimate that you put on the airplane each year? And last year accepted, of course. We average about 100 hours a year on the airplane, except for last year, um, with the various events, air shows, flyovers that we have done, or training. Um, to keep all the pilots proficient. Right, we, we do shows as far south as Brownsville, Texas, as far north as every year we go to EAA. Um, we were in Virginia last year for the uh, World War II flyover, which was sort of a virtual event once we got there, but due to weather. But um, we, we tend to fly quite a bit and, and not just, we do a lot of shows in Texas area, obviously, but we, we try to find Surrounding states and further out if we can, like Montana. Montana. <laughs> <laughs> you did that one year. So you've you've been around the country quite a bit, almost to all four corners. But uh, there's there's still time, right, to make it all the way up to like Washington or down to San Diego. Not yet. You have to put that on your future tour list. There you go. Well, we'll have to hold our breath going over the mountains. True. Uh, what uh, kind of shows do you have lined up so far this year? I know things are sort of off to a slow start, but we're starting to pick up some momentum. Uh, so what's ahead for uh, Devil Dog this year? This year we've already done a couple events and we have three events in May. So it's starting to kick back up. You know, weather's getting better and people are wanting things to do. So the first car show we had at the end of February, we did really well with. Now, part of the uh, the way that you uh, keep the airplane flying, of course, is through donations, but also through uh, ride flights. And uh, again, with uh, COVID last year, uh, ride flights were pretty much out of the question. Have you been able to restart uh, taking uh, passengers uh, aloft again? Yes, the yeah. first two events we were able to, to do some rides, and people were really excited with those rides. They enjoyed it. I think in the first town show, we did three separate ride flights. Three separate ride flights. Two cycles of burning, and we can take up to six passengers at a time with us on the plane. All right, and of course, the next logical question is how much does that cost? At the day of the event, that's $425. But if you plan ahead and get on our website and know we're going to be a place where we're doing shows, you can prepay for $395. Awesome. Uh, getting a, a little message from our moderator here. If all of you could uh, just speak up a little louder uh, when you're talking, some folks are having a little trouble hearing you. So uh, speak loudly and, and just just pretend like you're at an air show and there's there's uh, noise everywhere. Speaking of uh, being at air shows, um, obviously, if you've been to an air show anywhere in, in North America, you've probably seen someone wearing a devil dog shirt. Um, Amazingly enough, uh, I'm living in Oshkosh, Wisconsin right now. Last year, we had a rummage sale at our house, and a little girl walked up and was looking through every the things that we had for sale, and she had on a Devil Dog t-shirt. So uh, the, the fan base is everywhere. But where did the idea for the t-shirts come from? Um, one of our members back in 97 designed that shirt, and so the Devil Dog blue shirt we've done since 97. We've added a couple more colors. We've got marine red and military green. So if you're interested in a devil dog shirt, you can get them on the website. But um, he worked hard and it 
We have not need to change the shirt because everybody likes the shirt. Which one is the favorite color so far? Best seller. I like them all. The military green is a little cooler in the summer, and the devil dog blue is my favorite. There are marine people who love red. All right, well, we're going to try something uh, unique with uh, with our webinar this evening, and that is uh, we're actually going to uh, move out in a couple of minutes and take a walk around of the uh, the airplane. And uh, so hopefully technology will uh, keep up with us. But I just wanted to make sure this slide was up as well, which gives the uh, address of the uh, Devil Dog Squadron. So if you want to copy that down in case you'd like to help out and get yourself a T-shirt or find out more about uh, where the group's going to be, uh, is uh, DevilDogSquadron.com. So you can see that. All right, before we move into the hangar, um, any thoughts that uh, any of you would like to, to uh, bring forth from the panel? One of the unique things with this particular airplane, when they found them in Rockdale, Texas, they were using them to fly nitroglycerin down to the South America as late as 76. And even one of the Central Texas, the Centex wing, had flown right seat in that, and the main pilot had been a loop walker pilot. So, um, so it's got some history with that. But the airplane even never got to see action because it got as far as Hawaii before the war ended, but it was at Reese Air Force Base as a trainer then we found it in Rockdale, that it was found in Rockdale, Texas. But it, it had, it's, it's been traveling around into South America a lot too. There's some pictures out there with it in, in Belize um, doing that mission of nitroglycerin flying. We also did fire work in uh, Montana, uh, the fire work ship. Almost everything else it did. It's been a workhorse. And now we have the pleasure of letting people see it and representing the CAF and representing the Marines. So it's, it's, it's a great job for volunteers to do. Any uh, interesting stories that uh, come up with you when you're on tour, especially when uh, veterans come to, to see the airplane? I think the most interesting is we not as much anymore, but we would be able to be at an air show and we'd have some of these guys come in. One particular guy came up in a wheelchair and was talking to our crew chief and I had asked him if he'd like to get back up in the airplane and he crawled up there like he was 20 years old again like he and he knew where everything was and he sat there and just I don't think he ever thought he'd be back in a b25 again and he said well that's enough and then he crawled back down like he had put closure to it but then he started talking stories that his kids never heard before and that's what's such a great thing about being involved with this and being at air shows and meeting these veterans and hearing all of this this history that it brings the memories back to some of these pilots that they never talked about before. And so it's up to us as part of the CAF to keep that history going because we're losing these World War II pilots and, and crew, you know, daily now. So it's it's up to the CAF to keep this history going. Uh, speaking of history, uh, and you mentioned uh, the book that you've uh, got the PDF version of that's available from uh, the squadron, but uh, one of our viewers is wondering if there are any other good books or uh, resources that you would recommend for B-25s or uh, PBJs? Hmm. I don't, I don't have a, a quick answer to that one, but what we can do, if you send an email to that info at devildogsquadron.com with the specific questions, we can answer that. Other than just sending a link to this book, we can do a little bit more research and find other research material related to the Marine Corps and PBJs and certainly send that to you. Sounds good. And we'll, we'll include that address with the follow-up email that will go to all of our attendees uh, tomorrow or the next day after the, uh, after the broadcast. So uh, is, you mentioned Oshkosh earlier. Is uh, Devil Dog planning on being uh, at the EAA flying this year? We wouldn't miss it. <laughs> we have been to Oshkosh every year since we've been up. Since 2000, so we would not miss it. Um, how long? Of, how long of a flight is that? Um, that would be between five and a half to six hours flight, and we'd stop in Iola, Kansas, for fuel, and 
big group of people there come and visit us and help us out. And so we'll be there. Sunday to Sunday. Sunday to Sunday, right. Awesome. And you can meet the crew in person and get your very own Devil Dog t-shirt. Yes, um, spe speaking yeah. of crew, how many uh, pilots do you have for the airplane currently? Right now, we've got um, three PICs and we have four co-pilots. So we're, we're, we're in good shape with the pilots and keeping new pilots interested in learning as well. That's great. And uh, of course, aside from the pilots, uh, uh, what other uh, crew members do you normally take along when you're on tour? Well, we, we can carry 10. So we'll have a crew chief in the front and a crew chief in the back and then the passengers yeah, that will go on the trips with us. So we're, we have a full crew that we'll take with us to help educate and give the history on this airplane. That's great. Well, speaking of the airplane, uh, since it is sort of the start of the show, why don't we uh, head out to the hangar and uh, take a little walk around of uh, Devil Dog in its, uh, in its home there at Georgetown, Texas. Okay, give us just a moment. <laughs> now, folks, this, this will be good because uh, it's the first time we're trying this, and uh, hopefully technology will, uh, will keep up with us and uh, you'll be able to see the airplane. Uh, I've got a couple of pictures here of it uh, in flight, which is, the way it should be, right? But uh, tonight we're getting an up close, up close look at the uh, Devil Dog. So you know, once they get the uh, camera turned on uh, in the hangar, we're going to turn off the other cameras so you can get a much better view of uh, Devil Dog. Yeah, we'll just give them a few minutes to get situated out there. Yeah. So then, uh, uh, in addition to shirts, we also sell Devil Dog caps. Challenge coins, patches, a uh, lot, lot of things for donation. Uh, All right, looks like we're coming up in the hangar, so uh, we'll shut off these two cameras and uh, let the folks take it away. All right, Beth, we've got you. We've got you. You can see it. So go ahead and start with the walk around. All right, so here's the devil dog in its glory. You can see we've got the fairly new paint on it, so we're real pleased with that. Um, we've got the eight guns, forward guns, and the, the two side guns, uh, two forward side guns on each side. So that 12 forward guns could cut a ship in half when they were strafing before they skip on. So on the side there, you can see we've got Ozzy Parrish's name, the guy that restored the airplane. The glare is pretty bad here, unfortunately. But the airplane itself is in great shape. We've put over... <laughs> $300,000 in the airplane since um, 05 with engines. The wing's been off for a wing spar. We've got tails been off twice for corrosion. Um, tires themselves are now $6,500. So the main tires are $6,500 now. I can remember paying $1,500. That was a while ago. But things are to keep this airplane going, we put a lot of energy and a lot of hard work and a lot of cotton selling t-shirts to help keep it flying. Coming around to the nose tire. The weakest point on this airplane is the nose wheel. So we're real careful when we land, keep that weight off that nose, but it is the weakest part when the North American engineers found out about the crew chiefs out in the field at putting extra guns on the airplane. They said, stop, this airplane will collapse right here. So let us design the gunner nose. They also designed the uh, 
radar nose that the VMB612 had, and of course they had the Bombardier nose. And then the newest model, the H model, they had the 75 millimeter cannon. So here's the gunner nose, our devil dog. So it's interesting that in World War II, they didn't actually have nose art on these planes. Not for the VMB612 because of the, at night, the moon could reflect their location because they only flew at night. Their missions were only at night. And you can see the bombs represent the number of missions. And then in the 22 missions, the number three ship down the, down three merchant ships and one imperial ship. And then 23rd mission, like I said, she never came back. So whether she got lost because it clouded up that night or whether she got shot down or when they were traveling at night, sometimes they were 15, 20 feet off the water to skip bomb and whether they just got tired and then flew into the ocean, nobody knows what happened. So we have the right 2,600 horsepower engines on it. 2,600 cubic inches, 1,700 horsepower. That's right. right. Yeah. But, uh, and on the side of the nacelle, you can see the this was the third plane of the VMB-612 squadron. Um, a lot of people don't know that the control surfaces on this plane are fabric. Right, so the rudders, and the elevators and the ailerons are all fabric. That's because they had a shortage of aluminum because of all the airplanes that they were making. Greg, you have anything to add? Well, I'm listening right at the moment. And Jeff is doing a good job. If I come up with something neat, if we run over, I'll, I'll bring it up. Well, why don't we show them, because there's a flashlight sitting in the forward part of the bomb bay, show them some of these signatures from the VMB-612 yeah, squadron. So if you want to go, I'll just follow you over there and you can go grab the flashlight. And we also have signatures from uh, some of the Doolittles. Just, just above your head, there's a flashlight. Did you turn one It's on the bomb bay. Oh, there we go. There's some parts. Very good shots of some of the names. And we've got quite a few. There's probably a, a hundred different signatures here in the Bombay from different people. Yes, indeed. We were at one re reunion of the uh, of Marine Flyers in uh, Houston some years ago where we got a lot of these. So this Bombay is modified to carry our PX. Um, it wouldn't have this wood here. It would have the things where you could see Excellent. the bombs attached. And when they put the, uh, once in a while they could carry a torpedo, but they had to not close the bomb bay doors and they had to put the crew back in the front in and close the door because the, the torpedo was longer than the bomb bay doors were. But if something happened, they had to quick jettison that if they needed to come back and land for any reason. Well, do you want to climb up inside the cockpit and give them a little tour? Okay. All right. So when we teach somebody how to get into the airplane, we always talk about don't touch anything red because right there they got the emergency gear handle, which is red right next to the handle you would crawl up on. So we're going to crawl up here. As we come up, if you look straight up, you can see our, our stargazer. So there's the stargazer that they used to navigate by. And most B-25s have a turret there. Ours just had, the, we have the stargazer there. If we were, they were gonna navigate by night by the stars. Now, if we look, so we've got our cockpit, and you can see we've modernized it for travel to make it easy to travel. So we've got the modern avionics, but we have the old water throttle quadrant, 
that has all the old meals. The yolks are the same down here. We have our, our gear handle and our flaps and our cow flaps, our emergency brakes and all everything we need to be able to fly this airplane. We have an emergency hatch here. So if anything happens where we had to land with the gear up, then it would be one of our, the pilot's responsibility or the crew chief to open up the emergency hatch um, for us to, to be able to get out safely. Um, well, we don't talk about that normally, though. <laughs> no. <laughs> if we're given a rise, we do brief that. We have the emergency briefing, so everybody, if something happened, would know how to open it up in case something happened. But it's always good to be ready in case, but we look towards the back. You can see the crawl way towards the back of the airplane. Of course, the second best spot in the airplane is in the tail and for the tail gunner position. It's got a great view um, for traveling. But the two seats right behind us were for the trainers. They called them the training seats. Um, You can see the round hole is where the, the turret would, would have the seat and could work around it to, to shoot. But again, the VMB-612 flying at night didn't need any of that stuff. They were busy, you know, none of the Japanese flew at night. So they were going from islands, Saipan, Uwe Jima, Okinawa. They were their, the bases that they had been at flying out of. and. Uh, Mr. Uh, Savini had told us a lot about the, the stories of not much going on out there, but at night they, they fly very long missions. They were going over 900 miles to some of these places to look for the, keep the shipping supplies from the, the Japanese on the islands that they were at. So Steve, I don't know if there's any questions about uh, that people might have about the inside of the plane. Well, uh, nothing yet, but uh, I think folks are just uh, kind of uh, taking it all in as it were. Um, okay. The uh, When you showed the yellow handle before on the floor, uh, what, what does that control? That's our hydraulic pump. So if we had to manually hydraulic, um, get the flaps down or, or get the cow flaps open, that would help with that. Um, then we have the emergency gear handle here, which would have its own reservoir of fluid. So we did just pull on it, a good pull to get it to unlatch the nose and the locks from the mains. And then we'd pump 52 times to get the gear down if we had to manually do that. Uh, we also have an, in the back an emergency flap to get them down, but it's easier just to land at an airport with a little longer runway. And we practice the no flap landings for that reason. Good. Uh, with uh, with, Go the, with the, the, the squadron, uh, how long were their typical missions that they were flying? They could fly because because of the way they were designed with they cut that back the number of of uh guns and armament for some of these night missions they could fly up to 10 hours on some of these missions they had provisions for carrying a lot more fuel than we have today uh, today when we take this plane up the most we want to fly is about four hours it's pretty noisy um and there's no bathroom <laughs> So in that case, with me flying, it's probably less than four hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and speaking of uh, the uh, the noise in the in the cockpit, as we walked around the in the engine, those who were really looking uh, saw that the uh, exhaust uh, stacks are pretty short, so that gives the B twenty five sort of its unique uh, sound. But it also makes for a pretty noisy environment in the cockpit. Is that correct? It, it, that is correct. Thank goodness for noise attenuating handsets these days. That helps quite a bit. But um, the noise, the vibration, 
you know, three and a half hours. It, it's that's good for me. Yeah, at, at takeoff power here in the cockpit, it is 115 to 117 decibels. What'd you say, Steve? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and, and that's that's the old joke of how you could tell whether it was a, a pilot in command or a, a co-pilot on a B-25, depending on which ear they could hear of it, correct? That's true. <laughs> um, it's not on both sides. I can't hear out of either ear. <laughs> there you go. Um, and some of our uh, viewers would like to, if you could just kind of run through the uh, the instruments that are on the uh, on the panel up front. Okay. Let, let me uh, move this out of the way so she can fly forward. I'll, I'll hold this if you want to climb forward. No, we're fine with here. All right. So. Some of you guys aren't pilots. We have our main six pack that any airplane training airplane has. So we have our airspeed indicator. We have our turn coordinator. We have our artificial horizon. We have our directional gyro, our altimeter and our vertical speed indicator, which shows us the rate of climb or descending. And the rest of this stuff over here is how to navigate. So we've got the modern, modern equipment in there. So we don't can't not, I don't think we have anybody in our team that could navigate by the stars. Um, so we have a modern GPS. Um, our manifold pressure and our RPM is, is telling the, the throttle and in the air is gonna be our manifold pressure. The propeller is gonna be our, our RPM. And then we have all our instruments that are gonna tell us how well the airplane is doing with the oil pressure for each engine. We've got the fuel pressure. Um, the temperature on the oil is important to know. And then, of course, we have our cylinder head temperature. So the crew chiefs and the co-pilots kind of monitor that. And the pilot and pan is monitors that, too, because it's all important to make sure everything's working correctly. And then when, as we move over, it's, it's an extra set of instruments. So the co-pilot is easier for them to fly. Um, then we have our... Um, Carbur heat, carburetor heat temperature, and then we have our fuel gauges for the fronts and the back tanks on each each engine. So it, it's fairly simple um, airplane. It, it, it you know it has a it it we don't have the ox tanks, so we don't have to worry about transferring the fuel from the ox tanks to the main tank, and it just it feeds by gravity from the rear tank to the front tank. So we don't have to do much with the, the fuel other than that. But um, it's, it's an exciting airplane to fly. The biggest thing I had flown before this was a six place Beechcraft Baron. So it's heavier than anything I've flown, but she's a very stable airplane. Um, every time I get in the seat, I just think about, gosh, these 18, 19, 20 year olds climbing up in this airplane and the big responsibility they took and to really think, wow, it, it's such a privilege to be able to fly this and it's such a privilege to keep this history alive because, you know, they called this the World War II, the greatest generation and it's up to us to keep that generation alive and let these kids know today that our, the freedoms we have today is because of what these young men did for us and and some did come back you know they lost their lives for the freedoms we have today and i think more and more younger generations need to hear this history and maybe have more respect for the flag and more respect for you know what these guys did Yes, some truly incredible stories uh, that are out there. Uh, Beth, how long have you been flying the airplane? Um, I've been involved with the Devil Dog since uh, the fall of 96. I got my co-pilot rating with the Yellow Rose Squadron, and then I moved over to this airplane. I got my type rating in 2007. So I've been flying, really, this airplane I've been flying mostly since 2007 or 97 to, to now. So okay. uh, about, about how many hours do you have in the airplane? Good question. <laughs> uh, reported since uh, probably about 1,500 hours. 
Wow. Plus, I don't really keep track. And you're also a, a flight instructor as well. I am. Now, my total hours is about 2,800 hours and 28,000 28, hours. So I've got quite a few hours instructing, mostly in the small ones. But you're also an instructor for a B-25. I am the, the instructor pilot for the B-25. So keeping the, the co-pilots and, and keeping us, uh, us current. And then we have a gentleman, Al Maxwell, who comes and helps us with currency rights. And then some other pilots that do the official check rights. And how often do you have to be requalified on the airplane? Well, every year we have to get a what's called a proficiency flight from a, a certain examiner. Right now, Al Maxwell is doing that for us. Doug Rosenthal has done it for us. So um, every year we have to get current with the, the examiner for proficiency. Can you just walk us through the, the starting sequence for the, uh, for the airplane? <laughs> All right. Well, it's usually a two pilot thing. So to start it, we've probably gotten a lot of stuff ready, but you have, you'd start with the fuel pumps, turn them on to normal, and then we would turn, we'd get a, we'd want eight pounds of pressure on the fuel, and then we'd turn them on to high. Um, then we take the starter and mesh, we bring that back and get six cycles through the prop before we would make the magneto hot, the master would already have been on. And then we'll use this to prime it. That's to start the right engine. And then once it starts up, you know, we're keeping it primed till we have oil pressure. And then we would put the mixture rich and then keep it running and with it running, then we turn the fuel pump off and then we'd go to the next one. Of course, it's the same things, but then we've got to push the, the toggles forward to start the left engine. So um, it's a sequence. Sometimes it takes some knack. We got to make sure our throttles are in the right spot to start. So we have to move them up just right. And it's a choreography. And we need, yeah, it's usually two pilots working on it. Um, and then we need a good battery to do that. We found that out the other day because the airplane hadn't flown for so long that we had to get a jump start to get it started at the car show. Um, but we've got we've got the batteries charged and ready to go for Abilene. Um, April 30th, we'll head there and May 1st for their show they're having. Awesome. Now, as you're as you're starting the engines, you also have uh, you have a person standing fire guard as well to uh, help monitor the the health of the engines as they start. Correct. So we'll have the crew chief outside with the fire extinguisher, and he's doing a thumbs up if everything's good. If he sees too much fuel coming out because we've over primed it, he'll put a thumbs down. Um, or if he sees anything, you know, he's got signals that he gives us that we will respond to and do accordingly. And once it's running smoothly and he looks at and says, everything looks good, he'll walk to the other side so we can start the other side. Um, but it, 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 we, it takes a good crew of everybody working, working this airplane. Um, and we're a good co-pilot. The cruise resource management is, is, is really well developed with the co-pilot and the pilot. It's not a single pilot operation. The co-pilot will help with the starting. He will help do what the pilot asks him to do. He'll read the checklists. So we try to make it a crew concept. The, co the crew chief is was watching the instruments. He's walking, make sure we've done all the jobs we're supposed to do. And in an emergency, he's even gonna help with the checklist with us while we're attending to an emergency. All right, you, you mentioned the crew chief and uh the folks that fly with the airplane, but there's also another dedicated team of people who uh, help keep the airplane maintained and, you know, doing restoration. If someone wants to, you know, be involved in, in that end, uh, you don't necessarily have to be a, a licensed mechanic to be able to uh, help out with the airplane. No, you don't have to be a licensed mechanic. We have Ira Menon, who is our licensed mechanic. And when we come back from an air show, 
he and Ernie and Greg are on the airplane the, the following Monday morning to make sure they're looking for things. So they're, they're not waiting for something to break. They're looking for leaks. They're looking for anything that, you know, might have changed since we last flew it. So the airplane is very well maintained. Um, it's a pleasure flying it and having it so well maintained by these gentlemen. And uh, aside from the, the maintenance uh, volunteers, are, are there other volunteers who uh, who help out in the squadron? Um, we all help out when we go to an event and we're going to give the history lessons. We all talk. We, we, we You have a lot of people coming up to the airplane, especially Oshkosh. So we give them history lessons or we try to, you know, d get them to donate money for the T-shirts. Um, but it's a good camaraderie. We have about 100 members right now. So... Some partake quite a bit and help out quite a bit, but the airplane can always be washed on and waxed on. Now that it's painted, it takes a lot more work to keep her clean. Um, but, and members who can help find history about it or members who can take pictures and, you know, help keep this going with the pictures and PowerPoints and, and a lot of stuff that everybody can put their skills in on. Well, that's great. And you, you said there's about 100 members in the squadron. Are they all in the general area of, of uh, Georgetown or are they no, spread no. across the country? They're, they've got some across the country. And, you know, we've got members from Midland and Odessa and Houston and um, Virginia. Virginia. We've got people overseas right. that are members. So got one from Iowa, and so that's almost overseas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's here's a, a a rather technical question. We'll we'll see how how this goes uh, when launching the long torpedoes. Uh, was there any particular effect for the pilot when flying the airplane with the bomb bay uh, open a little bit, or even when they released the bomb? Was there well, like we said, they did skip bombing and they did that the same with the torpedoes. And so they would pull up and let the bombs go and try, just let them try to go trajectorily into the boat. And that's why they'd get that low to the water. And that's why they were getting shot at a lot. And that's why they added more guns and got North American to make more guns for the gunner nose or the, the even the bombardier nose they put in four guns with the two forward guns. So they'd have eight guns. So but this was a way they could, when they pulled up, they were releasing the bombs, the skip, skipping the bombs. So I'm not sure how much of a, a reaction they have what, or feel from that. And, and I haven't read anything on that. Right. And this plane, while in World War II, was considered a medium bomber, its maximum bomb load was only 3,000 pounds, which in today's environment is not much. Uh, so would there, I mean, we could surmise, we don't have bombs that we can go drop today and, and I don't have any stories that I can recall reading about, um, if you release, all the bombs weren't released at once. So if there were 500 pound bombs and you released one of them at a time, um, I suppose the pilot would feel some sort of, you know, upward movement of the airplane, but I don't know that it'd be all that much. Now I have heard on the H model with the 75 meter cannon, it, uh, 75 meter can, Mill, cannon, millimeter. millimeter cannon, it would slow the, slow the airplane down at least 10, 15 knots. I heard that it actually takes a jerk backwards or fell like a jerk backwards. And, it, it. and like Greg said, it fell like a jerk backwards. Um, one of the unique things about the forward guns is they couldn't reload them during the flight. So, you know, a belt has nine yards, is nine yards. So you figure they would do it in spurts, not to waste all their bullets. Cause they could, if they put, if they, they have the control right here and the pilot control all the, the forward guns, he could get rid of those bullets in a minute and a half. So the biggest thing was they would do it in spurts not to waste all the ammo if they needed it. Now the waist gunners and the tail gunner, they could reload. But that's where the saying I gave them the whole nine yards came from is they had used all the bullets and they mm -hmm. couldn't reload it. 
right? And all the forward facing guns, um, the empties had to stay in the nose also, because they couldn't dump the empties out because they're forward of the propellers. So there you go, something I didn't didn't know uh, about the uh, PBJs before tonight, so thank you. Um, yeah, I learned something new. With the, uh, with the airplane itself uh, working in the Pacific, um, was there, I mean, I, we talked a little bit about why the B-25 was selected for the night missions. Anything that, uh, that you'd like to add to that? I, I'm not sure if the person asking this question may have missed that uh, earlier in the, in the presentation. Well, from my perspective, since I'm one of the crew that works on the airplane during the day and, and in the middle of the summer here in central Texas, it can get 100 degrees really quick. The interesting thing about night missions in the Pacific, and I think about this every time I'm working on the plane, is it might be hot here in this hangar, but we're in the shade. In the Pacific, they flew all these night missions, and the crew that had to repair and work on them had to do that during the heat of the day in the Pacific. Out, and then there weren't hangers to put these planes in. They were just parked out there on the on the sand, basically. So it was uh, it, that was an unpleasant time. So it was ninety percent humidity. Yeah. But but for flying at night, um, anything's. I'm not sure there's anything specific about that that we can um, go after. I mean. As Beth mentioned, they did their navigation looking through the, basically the moon roof we've got on the devil dog so they could see the stars and navigate by stars. They didn't have GPS back then. And uh, in the Pacific, uh, what was the crew complement uh, there in the Pacific, especially for the night missions, uh, the crew that would have been on board versus uh, what was uh, flying in uh, Europe at the time? Well, versus Europe, they were normally six or seven flying because they had one to do the navigation. Um, in Europe, they'd have more because they had the, the tail gunner and the waist gunners positions that needed to be fulfilled. And the bombardier. And the bombardier. So um, they had a lot less crew. They could carry more fuel and they did a lot longer missions. There were a good nine hour missions that they would go out on. They'd go out and come back try to come back before daylight so they wouldn't be seen by the Japanese and get shot down because they didn't have the waist gunners and the tail gunners to protect themselves. And I know Dr. Um, George Savini talked about one of the islands had a lot of fog all the time, so they had moved because of that, because they had lost a few airplanes because of the fog. Um, so, I think that's where they ended up at o Okinawa. That's right. If, if you can't find the island you got to land on, you got to land in the water. How many uh, uh, gallons of gas do you carry normally on the airplane today? Well, this one doesn't have the ox tank, so we carry 652 gallons. And we're burning about 130. And sometimes we could burn up to 150 gallons an hour. So we, we couldn't do as long emissions as they could because they had the, they were designed to carry more fuel right. and, and make those long missions. And of course, uh, with fuel and uh, these older airplanes, they also have to have a, a very good oil reservoir as well. Uh, what's the uh, oil capacity that you're taking with you? The oil capacity, was, each engine has a 37 and a half gallon oil tank. So, um, we generally keep it between 30 and 35 gallons in each tank. Um, they're a dry sump oiling system in the engine. So there's a main fuel pump sucking all the oil out of the tanks and pushing it through the engine and the scavenge pumps pull it from the bottom of the engine and send it back through oil coolers and into the oil tank again. So um, the it's technically possible to in an emergency case to run this uh, start up and leave with a minimum of 21 gallons in a tank according to the manual but we're not fighting the japanese on an island anymore so we would never do that we always keep it between 30 and 5, 35 gallons per tank and it will burn and leak because they're radial engines um probably in our case right now we're down to about a half a gallon to a gallon per hour per engine 
which is pretty good. Normally it's two gallons an hour each yeah. engine. Um, so these guys work hard at looking for leaks, finding the leaks, fixing the leaks. Um, and that oil tank, when we replaced the engine Oshkosh, I got to clean the inside of that oil tank out and I got in, I could get my shoulder and my head inside of it to clean and wipe it down and clean it. Um, and I was a little late deciding that, you know, we should have gotten Mike Rowe because this is one of the dirtiest jobs <laughs> and we should have got him to do it and got some publicity, but I wasn't thinking about it until I was cleaning it. But um, it's, a, it's a very sizable oil tank for me to fit my shoulders in there and to be able to get in there and clean it out. And there's what, a hundred screws yeah. that you have to unscrew to open it up, to get in it and clean it out. But um, you have some well, unique adventures with this airplane, even working on changing the, the engine and making sure everything's right before we got the engine on at Oshkosh. Uh, being a, a nose wheel uh, airplane, what's it like to uh, taxi B-25? Uh, well, the hardest thing to do on this airplane is to taxi the airplane. Um, they have the brakes are 1200 derated to 250. So when you squeeze on the brakes to try to do something with it and nothing happens, if you're not patient and do more, then it'll jerk. And you, you can see the new beginning pilots going jerking left and right. And it's just, you gotta learn to kind of squeeze where you want them and then just maybe a little pressure on your toes and it'll it'll do what you're doing. But it does take some skill and some, a lot of practice for me anyway to, you know, to get it, get it down just right. And these guys put new brake discs in there, they call them stators and rotors, and then they're real sensitive, so. It's like learning all over again when they replace that. Right. Some people don't know that the nose gear on a B-25 is not steerable, right? So it's just a caster in front of the plane, and you either control the left and right going down the taxiway with engine differential engine thrust, or you use your brakes. Let's, uh, if we get a couple of uh, questions about uh, just the, the various speeds of the airplane, uh, uh, what's the uh, takeoff speed, your normal cruise speed, and landing? Of course, we let the road airplane rotate when, when she's ready. We, we keep the nose off, and once she lifts off, we kind of level off like a soft field takeoff for those pilots out there. Um, so I don't ever really look at that airspeed, um, but we cruise at about 180 knots. We could go more, but then we burn a lot more gas than 130 gallons an hour. So. We try to keep her at a happy medium where she likes running 2,800 um, and so 1,800 RPM and 28 inches is a good, good is a good cruise speed. Sometimes we go a little bit less than that. depends on depends on where we're going and what winds we got and what fuel we have on if we're trying to conserve fuel. Um, landing speed we use about 120 miles per hour on short final and it'll probably touch down about 95 but christian if you're not looking at the airspeed indicator then either you're just coming in landing and then just working it to keep a good landing right down the center line and you know whatever crosswind correction you need to make well in the uh, couple of minutes that we have left uh, anything else you'd like to show us uh, inside the airplane or any other stories you'd, you'd like to relate to our audience the tail oh we could go aft and, and crawl all the way back to the tail gunner position, but that might be, um, we, we could do that. Uh, or Yeah, let's, let's go, let's go for it. Okay, hold on a second. Let me pass this down to somebody. Okay, it'll be a bit jerky as we climb back out of the airplane here. <laughs> Oh, that's okay. It's all part of the experience, right? Okay. I'm going to watch the screen here so I can see where I'm aiming the camera. Oh, he's put something else up. Good. 
Yes, I it just popped up the uh, Devil Dog website as we're repositioning, so folks can uh, see what's on the uh, the main page there and the address, devildogdiscovery.com. So I guess what I'm going to have to do is somebody's going to have to follow me while I hold the camera. Okay. Well, you have to crawl on your hands and knees to get back here. My head's on the ceiling at the moment. Of course, a, a difficult position to get into normally, but while carrying a laptop, it's a little more challenging. But I guess probably no more challenging than uh, trying to get into that position while wearing a, a flight suit and a parachute uh, during World War II. Okay, so let me get this turned right side up here. This is a bit ad hoc. Now that I finally made it back here. So I'm looking at the tail gunner's site directly at the aft of the airplane. So you can just see the machine guns down below. But the nice thing about that position, even though I'm looking rearward as we fly, is you have almost a 360 degree view of the airplane, and especially if you get up higher, you can see there's the right engine in the wing, so, and then the horizontal stabilizer and the rudder over here. And it's, this is probably, I don't know if I can focus on, well, you can sort of see, here's the elevator. We well, mentioned earlier that it's fabric. So all of that surface, other than the trim tab on the back of it, is still fabric. And the same thing with the rudder on the back of the vertical stabilizer. But this is, this is my favorite seat when we're flying, because I can look anywhere and almost see everything that the pilots see up towards the front. That is an incredible view and uh, probably one that not too many people get a chance to uh, to experience these days. So I'm, I'm glad you were able to get the camera back there for us. Well, unfortunately, we're in a hangar, so you, you don't get to see much. But I had a, a great experience in Oshkosh back in 2017, sitting here and looking out the left side of the airplane and seeing Fifi flying there and Doc, the other B-29, flying right off of our right wing tip. And that was an amazing time. So now that I'm caught here and basically a three by three pole there's not much else i can do for this part of the webcast well we are just you know, we've uh, just over our time anyway so it's all right and uh just imagining what that that view would look like uh, in in a gorgeous uh blue sky uh flying to an air show somewhere and uh we're, we're going to look forward to seeing the uh, the devil dog at uh, at air shows uh, around the uh, the country this year and uh, of course we mentioned that they will be uh, in Oshkosh for the uh, EIA fly-in convention which is coming up in July. So uh, again thank you for joining us for this Warbird Tube webinar. You know if you have any suggestions for future topics or you know someone who might be of interest to our audience please email Leah Black at media at cafhq.org. We'll be back next Wednesday night seven o'clock central time and until then thanks to our guests uh, from the Devil Dog Squadron Ernie Henderson Robert Chalmers, Greg Peterson, and Beth Jenkins. For the Commemorative Air Force, I'm Steve Bus. Thanks for joining us again, and have a great night.